As crystal bridges in the momentary, we recognize our role as settlers and guests in the Northwest Arkansas region. We acknowledge the Caddo, Quapaw, and Osage, as well as the many indigenous caretakers of this land and water. We appreciate the enduring influence of the vibrant, diverse, and contemporary cultures of indigenous peoples. We are conscious of the role in colonization that museums have played. As cultural institutions, we have a responsibility to engage in the dismantling of historical and systemic invisibility of indigenous peoples past, present, and future. We choose to intentionally hold ourselves accountable to appropriate conversation, representation, connection, and education to facilitate a space of measurable change. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's so good to see you here for our virtual talk and demonstration. Uh, my name is Moira Anderson, and I am a part of our public programs team here at Crystal Bridges. This afternoon is a pretty special opportunity. Joining us from his studio is artist Stephen Young Lee, who will be giving a demonstration and talk on his work. Um, I want to, of course, uh, let you know that this opportunity wouldn't be possible without our generous sponsors of the Spotlight Talk series. So uh, I'm going to take a moment to thank Del Monte Foods and Pure Gold Price Club for their ongoing support of the museum programs. Thank you. And whether you're joining us over Zoom or tuning in through Facebook, we're so happy that you've uh, joined and we wanna make sure that you have the opportunity to interact with Stephen uh, throughout this afternoon and the demonstration. So here's how things are gonna go. Uh, Stephen is going to um, begin, of course, saying hello, sharing a little bit of uh, about his work, and then we're going to transition to um, an opportunity to see him at work, uh, doing working on um, a piece in his studio. Um, he'll be describing a little bit about this process, um, and we'll be having a conversation throughout that time. Um, but we want to make sure to leave room for you to ask questions, um, and I will be reading him anything that you'd like to submit in real time. So if you'd like to type out any questions that you have using the Q&A button, if you're here over Zoom, or feel free to type them in in the comment section on Facebook, I'll go ahead and uh, leave some time to read them as they come in. Um, while you're on Zoom, if you want to take advantage of our live captioning, uh, we are providing that this afternoon through the CC icon bar uh, located on the bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you'd like to turn them on, you just click the button and select the option to turn them on. Uh, I'd like to share a little bit of St uh, a little bit on Stephen um, before I turn things over. Stephen has been the resident artist director at the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts in Helena, Montana, since 2006, and he's had extensive career as a speaker and educator nationally and internationally. Between 2004 and 2005, he lectured and taught at numerous universities throughout China as a part of a one-year cultural and educational exchange. Then he went on to be a visiting professor at Emily Carr Institute of Art and Design in Vancouver. And he's lectured extensively in North America and Asia, including a 2013 panel, Americans in the Porcelain City at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. In 2013, he was one of several international artists invited to participate in New Blue and White, an exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston that featured contemporary artists working in blue and white tradition of ceramic production. His 2020 work, Vase with Dragon, is included in the current Crystal Bridges exhibition, Crafting America. And I do hope that you all get the opportunity to come and visit and see it in person if you haven't done so. Stephen, welcome. I'm so thrilled to that we get to see you this afternoon in your studio space. Thanks so much for having me. Um, this is the first, I think this is the first uh, virtual studio visit I've done as well. So um, I'm excited to be able to share a little bit of what, you know, what I've been working on and um, hopefully be able to talk a little bit about some of the, you know, the techniques and processes and then the, the content and, you know, um, thought process behind the work. Um, so for any of you who are, are tuning in, feel free to, to put any questions for it. I'm happy to answer pretty much anything. Um, and I can multitask fairly well, so I can work and answer questions as needed. Um, 
But I was thinking, you know, maybe I can start by, uh, I could show a little, I could show some photos of the piece that that uh, um, is in the exhibition at, at Crystal Bridges, which I've, I'll say uh, also, I'm just so thrilled to be part of this exhibition that um, Glenn Adamson and Jen Paget put together and feel very honored to um, have my work included with such an amazing group of artists and craftspeople across America. Um, and I had every intention to be at the opening. Uh, obviously that, you know, our plans, many of our plans have changed, but Crystal Bridges has always been on my bucket list of places to visit and it seemed like the perfect time to come down. Um, maybe that'll still happen before the, the exhibition closes. So, um, but I will share my screen here and I'll show, um, let's see here. So this is the piece called um, Base with Dragon and Clouds. And these are images that I was able to take here in the studio in our uh, photo setup. Um, and I <clears throat> normally document these pieces. So I have a, a almost like a 360 view of it. Um, you know, my work oftentimes, um, I'm, I'm kind of speaking to like traditions of porcelain production, uh, you know, historically. So, you know, often the pieces are, are made um, thinking a lot about like form, uh, forms and motifs or decorative, um, in, in decorative patterns that are coming from a variety of cultures. Uh, very often, you know, they they end up um, referring back to like you know Chinese history or porcelain history or Korean porcelain history, um, but as what well, also European history. So it's you know, and I think that's kind of tracks with what happened. Uh, you know, as porcelain was being discovered and then blue and white production was happening is like the the way that the information kind of translated through these objects um, as they moved around the world. So I, I just find that so fascinating, like that record and the, the time and the information that was being passed. Um, so this vase form is what, you know, some people refer to it as like a baluster vase, you know, which is a, you know, it has a, a kind of a longer neck uh, and a flared rim with a um, the rounded shoulders and then a, a base, a more stable base. But obviously it's this piece in particular has been, um, you know, I often refer to them as like deconstructed vessels. So, you know, I make the vase and then after I do all the decoration, I'll actually create like an opening or a uh, like a puncturing of, of the surface. And then as that goes through the ceramic process, the materials and, and the glaze will you know, everything starts to move and warp and the heat, you know, pretty radically transforms the form, um, but it still retains a lot of those initial elements. And then with this piece, I was drawing on, you know, I was really interested in, in like the, the dragon motif that is very prevalent in um, Asian culture. And, you know, the dragon represents a certain mythology, you know, or, um, you know, they have significance and symbolism in, you know, depending on the culture that they were being, um, you know, or depending where, like which culture was sort of like utilizing it. So this piece you can see, like there's a more traditional dragon head, uh, which you might see on like a, a Joseon dynasty, you know, Korean vessel. Um, but then the body of it is maybe more akin to like Puff the Magic Dragon, you know, so there, I do like to have this collision between like historical and, and contemporary references um, and thinking a bit more about like how these objects exist in the current uh, current time. And then the, you know, the uh, decoration around the rim and the base, you know, I'm often just looking at a lot of objects in museums or in books or on the internet and then um, kind of cutting and pasting things that I see that I think are interesting. And then, you know, sometimes they're from like European uh, ceramic history or, or um, you know, different place, ge geographic locations around the world. <clears throat> and then here you can see there's like a big chunk sort of torn out of the rim, which, you know, I was thinking it's either like broken or it was like a, like the dragon sort of took a bite out of it. <clears throat> and then I did have some process shots as well. So this is the the piece as I was working on it, and this is, you know, over I guess over a year ago, year and a half ago, um, 
But the way that I do the decoration, and I'll show a bit of this today uh, during this hour. And I use this process called uh, that it's an inlay process in ceramic. So what I'm doing to draw the, the pattern or the imagery is I'm actually using a knife to carve these lines into the surface of the porcelain. And then I fill that with um, a colored clay that you know rests inside of that. And then you scrape away the surface so it's flush with the surface of the, the vessel. And you know, this is a, a uniquely Korean contribution to ceramic production. Um, it's actually the word in Korean is called sangam. And you know, there was inlay taking place in other materials, but the uh, Koreans in like, I think in like the Koryo dynasty, when they were making those beautiful celadons with the cranes flying through the clouds, um, you know, they were translating that process into ceramic. So, you know, from there it sort of took life in other cultures. Um, there's a, I think in America, a lot of people refer to it as Mishima, which um, honestly doesn't really make sense because Mishima is uh, a town in Japan that doesn't even have ceramic production, but there's like a kind of a, a very unusual way that like it got associated with um, those marks on Korean tea bowls. So, but now for some reason, everybody in America calls it Mishima, um, where I just think you should call it inlay because that's the English word for it. But so that's how I refer to it anyway. Um, one of the, uh, you know, one of the questions that's always, you know, a question um, when you're looking at, of course, three dimensional works on screen is, you know, how big is this piece just for our reference? Good question. So it's probably around two and a half feet tall when it was uh, in this wet form. And then in the in the show, I, that might be more like 20 inches um, or, or less. So it shrinks uh, yeah. because it's tipped. Is that what? Both reasons. Uh, the porcelain itself, you know, through the whole firing process, it might shrink somewhere in the neighborhood of like 15%, 15 to 20% even in some cases. Um, but there is quite a bit of change because even from from this point, it's like there's still a lot of water in the clay and then all of that gets expelled in the firing process. This is a shot of the rim of that vessel. A little better lighting. And then here's the, the tail end of the dragon. This is the dragon's head. So you also notice that um, the way that I tend to uh, think of the imagery is I like the I, I like the way that this process translates onto the surface of the work so that it has more of a a graphic quality to it. You know, so the way that I have to build value or you know shading or anything, it's through like very specific marks. So either lines or or dots. So um, you know, I, I I like I like to think about through the decoration, not in, in like a painterly way, you know, it's really more of like a translation of imagery from, um, you know, from like very graphic, you know, almost cartoonish. Um, and that's intentional for the way that I uh, think about that, that work. And then um, after I do the decoration, then I will put the piece into the kiln. Well, there's two firings. The first firing is called a bisque firing. So that's the one that gets the initial water out of the clay and then it'll stabilize the, um, the piece so that it's it's got a little bit of strength to it. But you don't fire it hot enough to lose some absorbency. So um, once I do the firing, I actually then sand the piece down and then I do the inlay at, at that point and I'll show that today. And then, um, then I glaze the piece and it took me years to figure out how to glaze a piece like this that has a giant hole in it, but um, I essentially just like tape newspaper on top of it and then I pour glaze inside of it and then pour it out and then spray the exterior surface with uh, with the glaze. And then this is a shot of the piece at what it, the setup looks like in the kiln. So what I have here is the piece is fully glazed uh, and then I lay a bed of silica sand down on the kiln shelf and that's because I'm never exactly sure like what's going to happen to these pieces when they go in the kiln. You know, I, I like to have that space for it to reveal itself to me, you know, and um, 
I mean, I have some sense of like what direction it might go in, which is why this is over in the corner, but I anticipate this falling forward. Um, and because of the, as the glaze melts and everything is like, um, is uh, sintering or, you know, the glaze, is, the clay is moving, I lay this sand down so that it doesn't fuse to the shelf. And mm. that way I can, once it's, um, I can remove it from the kiln, then I go back and I, cold finish like the surfaces and sand everything and polish it. I think, you know, I, I'd love to ask a question too while we're on this. I, I'm sure. wondering because you mentioned, of course, you never quite know what's going to happen to the piece once it goes mm -hmm. into the kiln. Um, but, uh, you know, what's your process of balancing that working between chance and planning when you're creating the piece? Well, I mean, it's a pretty central part of my, of this body of work is that I'm, I'm in a way kind of speaking to like the nature of ceramics and then also uh, the evolution of like my experience in this working in this material, which, you know, early on I was a, a potter, like a functional potter, and I would sell my work through fairs and, you know, it's for a specific market. And I used to always be very like, um, like one, I was really interested in like how flaws can completely devalue an object, you know, so if you have a cup that in and of itself is very beautiful, but then there's like a little like crack in the bottom. I mean, it still can function as a cup, but then that crack kind of like negates its use or for the market. So you have, you know, we'd throw it away or I would throw it away and then we have to make another one. And I always thought that was so fascinating because there's this like standard of how the, the thing can perform in the context that it's being, you know, sort of made, made for the audience that it's being made for. So, you know, this work, you know, when I was in graduate school, I was thinking a lot about that. And like, there were so many times where like the image in my head of what I think was gonna happen just completely changed based on the material, the process, the kiln, whatever it might be. Um, so, you know, for me, it's a lot about like letting go of expectation and letting go of like my own sense of like wanting to master something, you know, is just really allowing the material, the form, the decoration to reveal itself. Um, but I do think it's important to, you know, at least with, with my work, or I feel it's important that there is a certain integrity in terms of like the replication of historic references so that it, it starts from a point of like, um, of high craftsmanship, but then it's kind of, uh, it's submitting itself to the reality of like, of the conditions. Um, so it's, uh, you know, and I was speaking to the docents about this uh, this earlier this week, and I mean, it's like a, it's almost like a, a mindset that I have to like constantly allow myself to be in. You know, not just with with this work, but it's like in life, right? It's like we always have these things that we're trying to like control, or you know, and it just sometimes it doesn't happen that way. And I think the other thing about it is that sometimes you learn things. Um, I mean, well, oftentimes, mostly you learn things through failure or things that you just like aren't uh, allowing yourself to think past like what you think the end point will be. So um, like an example to contextualize it is that like I spent like my whole career trying to keep glazes from running, you know, because then things stick to the shelf and then you ruin it. But actually glaze when it runs is like the most beautiful thing in the world. So if you can just flip that around and say, okay, we're just gonna let glaze run. And then what do you get from that, you know? But as a potter, like I never, I could even get there, you know? Cause that's like, the goal was to like not do that, right? So I think there are a lot of points where you can um, hopefully let that happen in the work and try to release your expectation as much as possible. Well said. So here's, this is a, a shot of the piece like right before I was closing the door. And then this is the shot of the piece after after the firing. Um, so you can see the difference here. And this one moved a fair amount, you know, and having made an, enough of these to have some sense of it, it's like, I can anticipate a little bit. So like this form in particular, there's a lot of weight up in the neck. So, you know, depending on where that opening is, it sort of pushes down on the, the shoulders and the body and you're releasing a lot of that, um, tension in the in the form so depending on where that takes place we'll, we'll maybe alter the form a bit differently and then you could see here like where the glazes is glazes like dripping off the pots of these 
these are just like glazed pools that were a, an after product, I guess. I keep them all, they're just sitting on the shelf. Um, do you do anything with them? I haven't yet. I mean, I just look at them, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> they're really pretty. Um, actually, hold on, I can grab it. Well, that'd be great. Yeah, they seem like uh, more of mementos then. Yeah, they're like little souvenirs from the kiln. In fact, I think these are actually those glaze drips that are in that, from oh, that piece. Beautiful. Yeah, so it's just this like, you can see these like white crystals that are growing on the surface and then the, the glassiness. And then on the other end is this, um, this is the sand that's fused, but it allows that release from the kiln shelf. So yeah, that, this is why I save them so that I can bring them on this, uh, this talk. <laughs> It's the only reason. Okay, so I'll stop sharing and then that I thought, you know, maybe it's helpful if people do have a chance to go see the um, the exhibition in person, um, just to have a little bit more context of, of the work, that specific work. And it's such a treat to be able to see those images too of when it goes into the kiln right before and then of course what it looks like after because that really shines a light on the process um or did for me personally of seeing you know how the work evolves yeah i always wondered if sometimes it's like it's like seeing the card trick you know <laughs> like not that yeah. it's a trick but and that's kind of how i i feel about it is that i don't even know what's going to happen honestly like sometimes it's like I'm just as excited opening that kiln. So like there was a part, I mean, this body of work too, it sort of helps, um, like it, it allows me to like really appreciate the things that I love the most about ceramics, which is that moment of like opening the kiln and just not knowing what the hell is gonna happen and then being surprised by something, you know, in a positive or negative way, you know, but being open to like, you know, to it being just what it is, right? So, you know, there are times where, especially early on where I'd open the kiln and it was like totally different than what I thought, you know, it's like, you can't stop yourself from creating an image. And then I would just bring it into my studio and I just sit here and look at it and I go home. Sometimes it would sit here for like a month or two. And then it would be like, Oh, wait a second. This is way more interesting than like what I could have anticipated. And then it takes you on a new, or for me, it's it like took me in a new direction, you know, and, enabled me to just kind of like open up my thinking a little bit more. So I don't throw much away. Like I just put things on the shelf and I just let it sit there and, and then oftentimes return back to it after a year or two. Oh, good. That's fantastic. And you're actually, so, um, you know, we of course talked before this, you're about to jump in on a piece that you have been working on for a little bit of time. Uh, yeah, exactly. I've, um, I was telling Moira that, you know, I have not been working that much this last year, just because, you know, for many reasons, I'm sure people can understand. Um, but I had this piece that I, I made, um, the, the form of it, it was a jar. And then it's basically just been sitting in like a, a plastic box for like a year, almost like six months to a year or something. So over the last few, uh, few days I've just been spraying it and kind of getting it back and it's like rejuvenated its life. So I'm going to do a little bit of work on that piece just to kind of talk through uh, some of my process. And then it might make a little bit more sense after seeing those photos um, that I just shared. Yeah, I'm excited. Do we want to take us over? Yeah, let's, so I'm going to set up my phone. <laughs> and on the way, we're going to get to see a little glimpse of, uh, of your space that you're working in. Um, which seems like you, you do have, a, you know, a lot of books, a lot of tools, other various objects within this area. Yeah, let me give you a little pan, panning of the studio. So this is my studio space. Um, I've got like shelves of tools and materials over here. That's the en entrance. This is my main work table. So I've got, um, you know, I usually do a lot of the decorating and glazing in this section. And then over here, this is storage shelves and a bunch of, this area is a lot of like test tiles or just things, cups. I do a lot of testing on cups to kind of see how things will turn out, um, different glazes. And then this is my kind of production space. So I have a, a pug mill right here, which is used to process the clay. And then I have a setup over here. This is called a, a jigger, jigger jolly, uh, mm -hmm. which is, 
it's not a, like an official jigger jolly, but it's one that I've sort of like uh, jerry rigged from an old pottery wheel. But I use that to make uh, plates. It's like a more efficient way to make a lot of plates, um, either for uh, functional use or I've done a series of these uh, plate wall installations, which is, you can see this is like a Tony the Tiger maquette uh, oh, yeah. right, right there. <laughs> um, and then this is kind of the main working area for my wheel and um, it, it looks complicated, but it's actually, it, it's this contraption here that my wheel is sitting on, it's actually like a lift so I can raise and lower the height of the wheel head, uh, which comes in really handy. I mean, it's good for my back uh, first and foremost, but then it also helps with um, if I need to get a piece at a certain level for trimming or decoration, that type of thing. Um, okay, so flip this around, make sure everybody can see. Okay, yes, is that a decent view? Looks great. Ah, the reveal. <laughs> that's yeah, the reveal. So this is a jar that's may maybe um, influenced more from like a Korean Joseon Dynasty, which is, you know, they have they would produce these beautiful porcelain storage vessels. And, um, you know, often you see them in museums and they're, one thing I really love about them, this one isn't so much that way, but like um, often when you see them, they're very misshapen. So um, the way these are produced is that there's two halves that are thrown. So this is like the base of it, which is more of a flared cylinder. And then the top part of it is like a hemisphere. So if you were throwing it the other way around, it would almost be like a big bowl. And then you flip that over and connect the two pieces together. And what's so beautiful about the Korean historic vessels were that um, they were made, I think, with a certain kind of, um, uh, it's not really expression, but they kind of allowed the expression to happen because they were, uh, they were producing them probably pretty quickly. So then, you know, the, when you put a heavy piece on top of this soft base, like sometimes it would warp, you know, or there'd be um, like a lack of symmetry in the form. And they, they just allowed that to, to be the character of the piece. So they weren't trying to create like perfectly symmetrical vessels. They were just trying to create vessels that had a volume because it still can act as a storage vessel, whether it's perfectly symmetrical or not, you know? And um, I used to see those pieces in museums and just be really fascinated by that idea of like allowing that to happen. Because I think, you know, when you think of uh, Chinese Ming Dynasty vessels or Japanese uh, Imari ware, things like that. It's like everything's about perfection and mastery, but then those Korean vessels um, just had this like beautiful life and character to them that were each individual, you know? And so I, I think a lot about that. And th this form is very uh, similar. It's kind of referencing that, that history of objects. <clears throat> and this one is probably, this is more symmetrical. Uh, but it'll change once I get it in the kiln. So, you know, I made I made it the same way. I threw these two parts. So this is the base, and then this top part, attach them together, and then after that, once I get these pieces together and the pieces um, reaches the right dryness, then I'll actually trim the surface of the pot just to refine that form. So that's what I thought I'd be able to do a little bit of today, and then after that, I go into the decoration. So. Um, these are the trim tools I use. They're, these are actually uh, kind of a higher end trim tool. It's made with a tungsten carbide uh, ah. blade. So incredibly sharp. Very, dur very durable too, correct? They're, they're durable in use, but if I drop it on the floor, this can crack. Yeah. So you have to be really careful. And I have done that. <laughs> Now I'd so, like to also uh, comment a little bit on because you um, discussed, you know, with the the Korean vessel, of course, and the way that you know they embraced, um, even if it was a little, 
you know, asymmetrical or misshapen, it still had, um, it still counted as a vessel. It still, you know, had mm -hmm. that functional use. Um, I'd love to compare that with you, you know, the way in which you create those openings in your vessels too, in your consideration. Do you consider your vessels to still have functional use? I think they function more as, a, um, I mean, they function, if there's a function, it's probably as a decorative object or as like a, you know, which I think can also sort of serve as like a, a converse, conversation starter, if you will, or like, um, you know, if we're referring to function or like a specific purpose. Um, and, you know, this whole body of work is definitely inspired by those pieces, you know, thinking about like, like trying to create something that has more of, of a, um, I, I guess, a more, uh, crafted or you know like mastered kind of form or surface but then allowing the kiln to kind of um it like put its own its own mark or characteristics into the piece yeah um yeah and then i think a lot of like the the context of the work too is to confront that question about you know what these objects are because i think if if they didn't have that element of collapse or the element of um you know the the melting or the you know the the deconstruction of the object then it's like you have to sort of confront like what is the purpose of of this thing you know like is it is it still about beauty like does beauty get negated because because it you know doesn't look like what you expect it to look like you know um or can beauty still have a form to exist, you know, in what's perceived as a failed object. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm very interested in those questions. You know, it's again, it comes back to those um, those experiences that I had when I was, you know, making work for a very different audience. You know, was thinking about like, well, where where does beauty lie? Is beauty about uh, meeting the expectation, or is it about uh, you know making sense to whoever is standing in front of it, or can beauty like you know, can those things be redefined or how do you allow yourself to redefine those those things? So I'm not taking a ton of clay off of here, just enough to um, maybe even out the thickness of the wall just a bit. And then again, refine that form. And I also use these, uh, these are like metal ribs, we call them, but they're like thin pieces of metals to help shape, shape the clay. And then I use that to do a final skimming of the surface. It's incredibly satisfying to watch. <laughs> it's very, for me too, it's very really nice. Yeah, I find I really enjoy trimming a lot, like even when making uh, more straightforward functional work, because it's like that final revealing of the form, which is can be very satisfying and beautiful. Yeah. So Stephen, tell us a little bit about your origin story as an artist. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so my, I actually was lucky to grow up in a, a creative family like my dad was a he was a graphic designer and came to the u.s uh to go to art school and then you know was was a pretty amazing drawer like he, he was very very skilled very gifted my mom also studied art uh in college she didn't pursue it full time but um you know she had a lot of skill and ability but then despite all that uh, as korean immigrants to the country like they certainly didn't want me to become an artist <laughs> you know, I think they they like many other people of that generation just like it was hard to imagine like what that meant you know and I think um even, you know even for my dad it's like he went into a field that had a bit more of a structure behind it or a uh, foreseeable career path you know and um yeah so I actually like I start I remember when I was little I always just loved making things out of clay more than anything else artistic you know I, I was an okay drawer 
but there's something about clay that just felt so natural and I, I wonder if it was the the directness of it or just like the the ability to look at things in three dimensions um so you know that was just what it was and then when I was in high school I took a ceramics class and I had a series of wonderful high school teachers that just helped kind of expose me a little bit more to like uh, the fuller capacity of this material and how to express yourself through it. And, um, you know, I would just be spending like all my lunch periods and extra time after school in the ceramics studio trying to make, learn how to throw, yeah. but still had no sense that that was a thing you could do. <laughs> you know, like I just, I thought it was just fun, you know, and, um, but then when I went to college, I actually went as a business major thinking I would, I don't know, go into advertising or graphic design or something and then um and then I kept taking ceramics and then I started to meet more artists who were working in this material and like what their career path was potentially going to be and some of them were teachers some of them were um you know trying to be work full-time working artists so I think once I had a sense of that then I you know I felt like it, I was just passionate enough about this that I decided to switch my major I just couldn't imagine myself taking any more business classes and then I um I just decided to pursue it full time after that and I'm very glad that I did ah, we are too <laughs> <laughs> all, all right, right I'm gonna transfer this over so you you're taking this uh to the space to start adding surface design correct yeah I I'm gonna move it over to my decorating area set this up Okay. I may be jumping ahead of myself too and asking this question, um, but I'm wondering, and I know that you've been, you know, thinking about this piece for a while, but are you going to go into it with a plan on surface design right now, or how are you approaching uh, what you're, what you're about to do? Um, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to just do a little bit today, but I, I'll, I still have to think about it, honestly, like I'm not okay. exactly sure uh, what's going to happen in here, but I think I can, I, I can figure some of this out now. Um, and if it doesn't fit later, I can always, uh, I can always do it over. Um, so I, I'll talk a little bit maybe about how I planned through some of that. Um, let's see here. Yeah, because I was wondering if this is typical for you as far as when you're approaching about, you know, to do your surface design on works, do you typically start out with a little bit of um, of a moment to, you know, play around and then let things emerge? Or do you have a starting point that you like to go with? I usually, I usually plan it out to some degree. Um, I'll show this. So this is my sketchbook. I usually keep this you know, close by. And a lot of times I'm just like drawing out some different like form ideas or different patterns that might be of interest and then thinking about how they might fit together. Um, or if I see a, a piece that I really like historically, you know, then I'll, I'll kind of do some drawings. So this is like a kind of a take on like a Choreo dynasty. Oh. Uh, they call them Maebyung uh, vases. So you know, that has that similar kind of crane and cloud design. Um, so, you know, I did make a piece similar to that. Sometimes it's very close to what I might draft out and other times I'm like changing as I go along, I suppose. Um, but, you know, I would say like, just historically, a lot of these, these vessels, they kind of follow a similar structure in terms of the decoration. Um, just see here grab my pencil so um you know there are often like like there are kind of sections that decoration can exist so it can be on the neck you know it could be hanging off the shoulder uh can be rising up from the foot um and then what happens in this kind of main space can be can differ right like you can have a pattern that repeats itself so maybe there's like a um like a peony, you know, that has a certain way that the vines are going through, but it's repetitive and can be um, can be kind of spaced out and like uh, laid out in a certain way, or like those cranes, you know, so the cranes were following a pattern where there's like a circle and then the crane existed in the circle. 
And then other times it's about like an, an image. So there might be a dragon or um, there could be even a more narrative image, you know, like a, like a landscape of some sort. So, so I think about that, like depending on what kind of, you know, if there's an idea that sparks it. So like, you know, the, the dragon piece that's in the, the museum, you know, like I was thinking a lot about like the, the mythology of the dragon and how uh, you have mythologies that exist in certain cultures and then we have our own mythologies or interpretations of dragon imagery and then when those two things can collide then you know how does that then exist on the surface of the piece so that was one where i kind of knew what i wanted to do on the surface and then um and then the, built the pattern around it you know or you know figure out which pattern would go around it and and it also drives the form as well like the piece in the in the show you know, I like that there is a um, that that baluster vase, you know, kind of exists in both Asian and European culture. You know, so it's not as specific as, like, say, like a um, this Joseon Dynasty uh, uh, vase or jar form. So I'm often like thinking about like how those layers of um, source material are are existing and coexisting on the work. So here, what I was thinking I could do is, um, how well you can see this, but I'll, I'll, there are some motifs in pattern that um, I've often seen to refer to as like hanging decoration or, um, you know, as I mentioned, like some are kind of rising up from the, the base. So often on these shoulders, like, you know, it's something that's kind of being pulled down and with the, a lot of like traditional Chinese and Korean, um, like if there's a dragon flying through here or a phoenix, then uh, many times this is a cloud motif, you know, so it's as those things relate to each other. Um, but one that I thought could be interesting is there's a there's this one kind of hanging motif that I see a lot in um, Korean pottery that I thought I could try. I actually have to center this on the wheel. So this is the tool that I use. It's it like this kind of like when you go to art school, they sometimes give you this little starter kit for carving linoleum or wood. Yeah. Um, it's really simple. I mean, people think I have some kind of magic tools or anything, but it's just this little chisel tip. Uh, I use this probably for like 95% of the drawing. I love that. Um, and you know, and it, I had this question the other day from the docents about whether I like freehand all the decoration or if I um, have some process and I'd say it's evolved over the years where you know I, at the end of the day it's all like drawn but then I do have a process of like setting up registration marks to uh, confine like where the drawing is going to be and then I can boundaries yeah so like this tool here was life-changing for me but this is something called a a decorating disc. So oh, wow. it's basically just like a clear piece of acetate that has, you know, like an odd number. So if you have to divide a circle into fifths or sevenths or ninths, and then this one is even. So it goes like from four to 10. Um, I didn't use these things for probably like the first three years. And I was just like winging it. And like, this has saved me so much time. It's like, I can't even believe it. I can imagine. <laughs> um, so I'll often, I'm putting the even one on here. So what I'll do is I'll kind of follow down and see if I start here, the tenth would be there. So that's the width. This is the width of whatever the motif would be. And it's kind of small. So I'm going to go to the next one and I'll go to the eighth which seems about right for the motif that I'm gonna do, which is uh, similar to this one here. You could see oh, yes. this yeah. hanging, kind of hanging motif. So I just gauge that and then, um, oh, I guess I got to draw them all. So I'll go <laughs> around <laughs> and then I'll just hit all the eighths. Okay. 
Okay, so I've got those all marked out. And then I need to have a line here. I want to have a line that um, where the motif will start. So I just use my finger against the, the rim of the piece to give me a, um, a consistent width. Hmm. You can't totally see this here, but this was like a woodworking trick that someone had taught me once. Okay, so that's my first line right here. You can see it's not very deep. It's maybe like two millimeters deep. Yeah, it's, it's almost invisible on the screen. So I imagine it? it's really small and thin. Let's see, I wonder if I can zoom in. Nope. Yeah, it's a little hard to see, but um, Keep adding. I'm sure we'll start seeing more as they evolve. So then from there, I want to figure out like what, how far down I need to go. So a lot of times I'll just draw out, let's say the first one. Okay, so can you see that? A little right bit, yeah. Little bit. Here, maybe I, I could show it a little closer. Okay. There we go. Is that better? Yes. So that's just like a rough out of the first, um, the first one, and then let's see if I can I'll be able to get this thing a little closer. Hold on one sec. Much better. Is that better? Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay, so then from here, I want to draw a line that tells me where this is going to be and then where this is going to be. So I use this compass and I'll kind of set that. So this, the pin is resting up against the neck of the, the vase. Uh, and I can draw that registration line there. And then I went at the bottom. And this is just a soft lead pencil, so this will burn off in the firing. And then the last thing is that I'm trying to, I'll just eyeball the middle point between these two. So I'll go around and just mark that. And that's about as much as I need to just then start drawing. So that just makes it a little easier because then I can start from that first mark, carve in, and then end up at those registration points. It doesn't look like you're digging in that deep with the tool. Is that correct? Yeah, not, not very much, just enough to get a just a thin layer of of clay in there later. And that's when you, where you mentioned that inlay is gonna take place. And that's yeah. Where... Yep. So I'll do this one. I won't do all of these completely, but just yeah. to give you an idea of what it looks like. So this one, there's a, can you see that there's like two lines here? Yes. Okay. And then there's the interior. I feel like we're uh, in class with you almost. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Everyone go back and make their own, yeah. their own vessels. You know, and I do think that, um, especially since, um, you know, part of part of your life is also um, a, a teacher, an instructor, too. What's one of the th if we were in class with you, what's one of the um, what's one of the things you, you think is important for your students to know or something to really focus on? With your teaching? I think it's, um, you know, you might hear this in ceramics a lot, but like trying to really 
like if you're just starting ceramics, I think trying to release yourself from the preciousness of the object as much as you can. Because frankly, like in ceramics, like the, the only way in my experience to learn how to get better at something is you just have to keep doing it over and over, you know, until you start to really become familiar with the, the material or the process. Um, and I'm not really talking about craftsmanship so much, but it's just kind of familiarity, you know, or, or even experimentation. Like, you know, if you only have like one precious cup that you're making and you're trying so hard to get the perfect glaze and the perfect form and everything, you know, it's only one chance at it. And there's so many things that could be happening. So like, if you just make 10 cups, you're going to learn a lot more about making a cup and about what kind of things glaze can do on it, you know? So I do think that's, that's something I really think a lot about is like, how do you just try to generate as much information as you can, like through these things. And, and with ceramics, there's so much trial and error that you just kind of have to like, just keep doing it and keep making more things. So let's see. And this isn't the most exciting part, <laughs> you know, just, it just takes time to sit here. But this is essentially how, what happens. And um, I guess the other part about this work is that you'll notice like everything's still pretty wet. So like I have to, you know, keep this, fairly wet so that I can do all this decoration. So then um, I need to finish all the decoration before I can then create, like start to break apart the piece to make the opening. And then at that point I can put it into the kiln, or let it dry and put it in the kiln for the first firing. But, um, you know, once I kind of lay out the pattern, the decoration and the surface or whatever is being drawn on it, um, I have to just keep going until it's done. So I usually have to commit a couple, two or three days just to like, uh, powering through it and right. then letting it, letting it dry out. But yeah, so that's, that's what that part of it looks like. Um, I'm just going to put this aside here real quick. So I have this piece. This is a, this is a vase that I actually end up having this big crack in the bottom of it. Um, but I thought I could show the inlay piece of it. So you can see here I've drawn this like repeating pattern, which is um, inspired by a, an old Chinese uh, Chinese vessel with iron decoration on it. Mm -hmm. But I just love this like repetition of this, um, this kind of darted uh, leaf shape. So you can't totally see it, but like the carving with the knife creates this raised edge because yeah. the, the knife's sort of pushing that out. Um, so I actually go back in and I'll, I'll just sand that flat. And it sounds, I mean, fairly dry too. And this is before you go in and punch through. This one's actually fired already. So this yeah. is a, um, I put it through the first bisque firing. So that's why it's, I have to sand it and it's a little bit more elbow grease. Yeah. And normally I'm wearing a respirator so that the dust doesn't get all over me, but um, hold on one sec. So then I sand it and then I have to blow out all that sand that gets, or the mm -hmm. material that gets stuck in there. Um, which I normally use like an air compressor in the, the ventilated space. And then this is my, my bucket of slip. So this is actually, even though it looks green, it, this is a cobalt blue slip. Um, it has a little bit of chrome in it, I think, which is why it has that green coloration. Okay, and then from here, let's see, I'll just, Go ahead and fill that in. So you cover the entire surface. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, this isn't the traditional way to do it. I mean, I think traditionally, um, all this happens when it's still uh, when it's still leather hard. You know, sure. they'll uh, do the carving and then just fill it in and then scrape it off. Um, I don't know. I kind of developed this, I guess, just specifically for me. It works for what I do because um, one, I didn't love the dust from the scraping it all greenware, and then the other is that. Um, this makes it easier to handle some of these objects and then it it's also very satisfying to just scrape oh, off wow, the yeah. clay <laughs> and I could save this clay which is good like or this slip I'm just scraping it right back into the bucket I think this is what we've been waiting for <laughs> <laughs> okay and then And this is a, just a damp sponge. There's a bit of residue that get, gets left behind, but a lot of that will, will burn out. So you can kind of see, you know, it's the slip is staying inside those lines. Yeah. Um, and then at this point, I can dip it in glaze and then the surface this is what it would look like after it's fired. So you can kind of see with um, with this piece and then also the one in the museum, right. uh, the blue is like creeping out of that, those lines. Um, yeah. And that's that's intentional. It's like I've been trying to figure this out for, had, had been figuring, trying to figure this out for years, but what's happening there is the glaze is actually moving just a little bit. And it's, it's drawing that cobalt pigment out of those, those uh, inlaid lines, um, which is another reason why I really in particular about this style of imagery is like trying to build up the image with line only, you know, mm -hmm. or or dots, um, because I like the clarity of that. And then you have this little haziness that's coming out with the, the cobalt and the glaze. And that's happening during the firing that the glaze is pulling it out? Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, there's that record of like gravity essentially right. you know because the glaze is getting pulled down so yeah that's what the these are like what the function my functional pieces look like it's like this is a, a cup teacup kind of thing <clears throat> but as we already said it's interesting to think of that word function and uh, yeah the vessels that are whole or un you know broken and i even hesitate to use that word broken too <laughs> right yeah, when I first started making this work, it was funny, um, even here around the studio, I'm gonna shut this camera down. Um, you know, like I'd be rolling these pieces down the studio hallway and, and like the other residents would be like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You know, like like just thinking it was this explosion of failure. You know? <laughs> and and wow. so it, it sparked a lot of those conversations early or like those are some of the conversations I have with, um, with people who see the work in in shows or museums or whatever, um, you know, to be able to talk about like what is like is it a failure or is it still beautiful or is it, um, you know, like like people contending with their own sense of like what the piece should be or shouldn't be or whether it it's a failed attempt at that, um, which I think is interesting because it kind of recalibrates your your thought process around like just what an object's significance is, you know, and, and how it either functions or how it sort of plays a role in your, um, you know, in, in like conversation or in your kind of experience with, you know, with art or, or, or things around you. Phenomenal. And, you know, we're coming towards the end of the, um, of the hour, which has been such a treat, but I wanted to know if you wanted to end with just some really fun rapid fire questions just to <laughs> conclude. Yeah, sure. You ready? Bring it on. Let's do it. Okay. So a few of these, of course, are a little bit silly, but you know, some are directed as, uh, for you as an artist too. So, uh, quickly, you're just going to answer these with uh, minimal thoughts, okay. um, coffee or tea. 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 Okay. I don't like I don't like coffee at all. <laughs> okay. Favorite color? 
Blue, I know that sounds cliche, but blue is my favorite color. It was expected, okay. Uh -huh. um, what would be your desert island book? Oh man, I thought you were gonna ask me my desert island meal. Um, <laughs> desert island book, oh gosh. I don't know if I have an answer to that one. That is, that's a tough one. I'll take meal too, since it's around lunchtime. That's probably more on the front of the menu. So this is actually a, a, a this is a question of my son and my my son asks me this all the time. So, um, and we have the same meal, but basically it's uh, kalbi, which is a Korean uh, grilled short rib, and naengmyeon, which is a cold noodle soup. But it has to be made by my mom. There's no other substitute for it. So, and eaten together. We, yeah, and if we and it's basically like if you had to eat one thing for the rest of your life, what would it be? It's like that's it. Oh, I'm hungry now. All right, um, artist, living or dead, that you'd like to inv invite to lunch this afternoon, I guess, to share that meal. Oh, um, maybe Ai Weiwei. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and then go ahead and complete the sentence. Art is. Hmm. Oh, that's a tough one. Art you is overthinking it. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that came to mind is art is freeing, I guess. I love it. <laughs> Wonderful. And I think that that also rounds out, you know, from the joy that we that you've just been sharing, of course, with us about your process and approaching your work too, um, which I definitely got that sense. Um, any last words, Stephen? Um, no, I, I really appreciate being able to um, have this time with, with you and with the other folks. I hope it was uh, interesting. Um, we're, we kind of hit it right on the, the head here with the time. So I'm glad that, that worked out. And uh, yeah, I hope everybody gets a chance to go see the show or engage with it virtually if you can't be there in person. Um, it's a pretty, I, I mean, I just think the whole effort, you know, by um, Jen and Glenn and, and, and the museum was like, phenomenal you know I mean it's like a it's a major show uh that celebrates craft and and all these incredible makers um in the U.S. and um you know it's unfortunate that the pandemic didn't allow for the same viewership you know in person but I, I hope that while there's still time that um that can kind of make up some ground there you know and people can see that but uh it's just an honor to be included in that I really um I feel very grateful for it Absolutely. And, you know, it was such a such a treat to be able to see you at work in your studio and talk with you this afternoon as a silver lining, maybe to this virtual world that we're living in right now. It was so great to have this opportunity to connect and I had a blast spending some time. That's great. Well, yeah, thanks again to you and, and to everybody that was part of this and and for all the different programs. There's all kinds of great programming through Crystal Bridges that um, I've just been really impressed by. So. Uh, thanks for doing what you are all doing, because probably if the, if it was just like a normal year, we might not even be talking about this, you know, we're having this ability to like go and visit all these virtual spaces. So that's, that's a positive, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Stephen, it was wonderful to uh, see you this afternoon. And I can't wait till we speak again. Great. Thanks, Myra. All right. And thank you, everyone for tuning in. We'll see you next time.